Welcome to our 11th series of uh, executive workplace webinars. Really pleased to have you this morning. Um, I hope uh, you're all doing very well. Um, I'm very excited to present this webinar, how to prepare for a return to the office. Uh, definitely a topic on everybody's minds and one that um, our speakers and myself are really passionate about. Firstly, um, little announcements. We had a change of speaker. Uh, unfortunately, Angela Cameron um, couldn't make it. She um, tested positive recently and she didn't want to take the risk and she didn't feel, felt really good. So very lucky to be joined by, by Karen and Nina this morning. Um, a little word about our speakers. Karen and Nina, you're on mute. Feel free to unmute if you want to say hello. Um, Karen is the head of marketing for rent kill um, and she looks after marketing and research, but broadly more customer engagement. So she's at really the forefront of what our customers want across APAC. Um, and she's got some really interesting studies to share with regards to health and safety, which aligns a lot with the priorities that you've outlined in previous webinars around what was the concern by returning to the office. Um, so thank you, Karen, for making it a third, a third no short notice. Thank you, Peter. And Good morning, everyone. We also have uh, Nina. Um, Nina is the founder of Transform Team, uh, which is a specialist management consultancy specializing in workplace strategy and flexible workspace. Um, she uses a human-centric approach and helps leaders transform the way their teams work, not just at the physical workspace front, but at a broadly people management uh, level. Um, she's helped the um, Canberra um, government transform the way their employees work and increase uh, the take up of flexible working. While she was in Australia, she's been a contributor to media on the topic of flexible working and uh, she's now based in Wellington. Nina, good morning. Good morning, thank you. We're an international group, aren't we? We are indeed, indeed. Um, which goes to talk to the diversity and probably the upcoming mobility of the workforce seems like we are going to be uh, a lot more diverse as we get to work um, remotely, digitally, but also as uh, borders reopen, which is uh, quite an exciting perspective. Um, without further ado, I will jump into the table of content for today. Um, so that was it for my brief introduction. Broadly, why are we doing this as we've been doing the other webinars? Um, we're really passionate about creating space that, that helps people, that helps people be happy, businesses be productive. And broadly, we think that has a tremendous effect on society and making workers, but also people happier. That's our purpose. That's why we do it. And the point of these webinars is to bring you experts, to bring uh, tips, advice, and basically knowledge around how to navigate these times. Um, as we'll go through this presentation, the first part that we'll look at is what is the point of view of leaders? Um, and we'll show you some data that we gathered from our previous webinars, from our customers, um, to show you what other leaders are thinking in that space. We'll then uh, talk through a um, in details research on health and safety that Karen will be presenting. And we'll then move to Nina, who will tell us the point of view of employees, because what, what we've seen is there is certainly a bias between leaders and employees when it comes to what do we want um, in terms of how we work and how we approach the workplace. We'll then briefly have a look at why it matters to get it right, what other companies are doing in the space, and we'll finish with a Q&A. Um, I really want this to, to be interactive at the end. It's not a presentation about us. We'll use the information to inform the discussion, but please, uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box. I will read it out and, um, and have our um, speakers answer any question you have. Of course, feel free to reach out at the end. We'll have this event recorded and posted and um, share detailed contact for Karen and Nina at the end of this session. Um, so about a month and a half ago, we had an event on resilience with rugby player Dan Carter, and we asked our uh, uh, attendees, what were the main challenge with hybrid work? Um, interestingly enough, people, people, keeping people engaged was, was the main one, collaboration and innovation, 
and the others. Now that's the leader's perspective. So it's really important to note this is what we as leaders think is a challenge when it comes to hybrid working. Now thinking about the office and, and space more broadly, um, when we ask the question, do you think it's important to have physical space to support company culture as leaders, 97% of you said, yes, it is. So it will be interesting to see the perspective of, of employees on that note. Now, because physical space is important to support culture, we asked also, why do you think people would not want to come back to the office? And the fear of getting sick was cited by leaders by 70% of respondents. Then the cost of transportation, obviously, commute time, you have to earn the commute as leaders, and half, over half, a quoted demotivating office culture, which is, again, that's the point of view of leaders. And then the other pieces, the poorly designed environments, that's, that's a topic we're obviously quite passionate about. We've seen earlier people want to come back to collaborate, but most offices are designed for individual work. However, wait and we'll see what employees actually want with this. Technology uh, was cited as being good. Uh, only 18% of leaders said poor technology was a barrier. Again, I'm quite interested to know what uh, probably the employee and the younger generation think about that topic. Um, that's all for me in terms of introduction. I'll hand over to Karen because that piece on fear of getting sick is, I think, really critical. Um, we now have five generations working with the same roof. They have different aspirations, different fears when it comes to that. And if we look back in history, the topic of pandemic, I think is only going to become more prevalent in our society with additional mobility, additional connectivity between people. So this is something as leaders we really, really need to take seriously. Uh, Karen, without further ado, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre. Um, look, it's good to see um, that leaders are quite in tune with one of the main reasons that their, their people are a little bit concerned about returning to work. And certainly we can show some research later on in the presentation that actually substantiates that, you know, staff are genuinely concerned about returning to work, mainly because they're concerned about getting sick. So we'll move on to the first slide, Pierre, please. So in addition to the ongoing pandemic, um, trying to open doors, trying to get back to BAU, there's no surprise we have many, many more challenges facing us right now in New Zealand. The media is covering news of super colds that are now coming upon us. They are advising that, you know, flu is going to be tougher than ever before because we've skipped two rounds due to lockdown. There are many, many challenges that we do have to face as we continue to try to return to BAU. Next slide, please, Pierre. So a recent study by PwC specifically for New Zealanders, when asked, would Kiwis like to return to continue to work from home? Over two thirds of workers said that they would like a hybrid approach. They would like a combination of home base and office based working. And whilst we recognize that's not always applicable depending on the business you operate, um, it is uh, important to note that you know, two thirds of employees are saying that they would like uh, a remote as well as in office um, approach to working. So in terms of bringing your teams back to work when they are um, in the workplace, there are many, many factors that we need to consider that are affecting the ability to return to BAU. COVID is not going anywhere. And I know we all have the fatigue of seeing yet another strain or the impact that COVID is having in a particular uh, region where there's been an outbreak, but it isn't going anywhere. The good news is we are getting better at managing it as we become more learned about how to manage it. As I mentioned, we now have our winter season coming upon us and the onset of cold and flu will further compound that sickness cycle that is prevalent in the indoor environment. Um, Pierre mentioned we're competing with working from home. We do have that challenge of listening to our employees moving forward. What is it that they want? Do they want a hybrid of working from home and in the office? We know that they will. So that, you know, that is another competing factor. And there are litigious concerns. The media certainly doesn't help at times. You know, who has the responsibility to keep our staff safe? What happens if one of my employees catch COVID and can attribute it to the workplace? And businesses are genuinely concerned concerned about if I bring people back en masse, how can I keep people safe and what are my obligations? 
The one thing that we do know from the research, that sentiment around what, what best practice hygiene should look like has never been stronger. Sentiment around best practice protocol has never been higher among our employees. And mainly that is because of the media, the CDC and the WHO continuously updating us on what we need to do to stay safe. Four in five Kiwis feel at risk today feel at risk in general of catching uh, COVID SARS-2. And almost half of workers between the age of 25 and 35 feel moderately at risk of exposure. Nearly two thirds of our workers agree that they would be more comfortable in the indoor environment if it had an air hygiene protocol. And I'll touch on this a little bit later, but we do know that over the last 12 months, the Centre for Disease Control and WHO have characterised COVID SARS-2 um, as, a, as a, an aerosol viral transmission. So it's very, very important that we consider our air hygiene protocols, access to natural ventilation, or in the absence of ventilation, what else can we do to keep the air clean? Because our employees know that air transmission uh, carries the number one risk of catching COVID SARS and, and other viral illnesses, of course. Over half of Kiwis believe that uh, businesses should be doing more to protect their customers and staff. That was the most important one, Pierre. And I think it's very, very important that as we consider returning people to, work, to the working environment, recognizing that employees are expecting business owners to ensure that high levels of hygiene protocol are maintained is very, very important because you want people to return confidently and of course, keep them safe. Next slide, please, Pierre. So this is not really news. We know how germs are spread um, person to person if someone is sick in the indoor environment. And we know at the beginning of the pandemic, hand washing and hand sanitization was considered incredibly important. In fact, it was the number one factor um, in keeping us safe. Still remains important, but as we've learned through the, the pandemic evolving, air to person has become the number one risk in terms of transmission. And of course, contaminated surfaces are also um, a risk when it comes to uh, people getting sick in the indoor environment. This is not necessarily very pleasant for first thing in the morning, but it does show how virulent uh, COVID SARS can actually be um, in the indoor environment. This is a representation of a sneeze. And we know again that COVID SARS-2 is characterized by air transmission. Larger droplets will fall to the ground quickly. If someone sneezes, they will fall to a surface and contaminate a surface. And a surface can be cleaned and a surface should be cleaned quite regularly. The concern is for those smaller droplets that are three microns or smaller contaminated aerosols, they can linger in the air for hours. So when we look at things like perspex screens in a bank or dividing off a space where, you know, there's joined desks, they can be somewhat effective, but remembering that aerosols travel high and they, if they are light, they can stay in the air for a very, very long time. So this is why um, indoor environments are the most risk when it comes to people catching COVID SARS-2 influenza and other airborne illnesses. And this is a representation, I think it's worth pointing out that we do support the government's advice to access natural ventilation where it is reasonably possible and keep windows open, although we do know there's various factors that don't always allow us to keep the windows open. But this shows that even with open windows and fresh air, um, as the fresh air is moving through an indoor office space, if there is contaminated uh, air or if there are sick people, the air can become dirty, toxic or sick very, very quickly. So it's very, very important to know what controls you can bring into the indoor environment to continuously ensure that that air is being kept clean and free from sick contaminants. Okay, so key steps that we can take to minimize the risk, and some of these are very, very straightforward, but what we have noticed um, is a little bit of a sense of complacency, surprisingly enough, over the last couple of months. Maybe it's because of COVID fatigue. Uh, maybe people are just genuinely forgetting to, you know, put those minimum protocols in place. We know from the SARS epidemic that it took just two years um, for our Asian counterparts to return to uh, pre-SARS habits. Um, so people do tend to forget very, very quickly they want to forget they want to move on so some steps that we can take to minimize rest risk key areas that you do need to consider in your working environment the number one factor is ventilation 
Do you have access to fresh air? Are you continuously ensuring that your staff have access to fresh air? What clean air protocols do you have in place? If you don't have natural ventilation, if you do have smaller office environments, you do need to consider that there are solutions out there that can mechanically clean the air in the absence of having access to that fresh air. Surface hygiene, having re regular disinfection protocols, really, really important. Hand hygiene, we all know washing our hands, singing happy birthday twice as you do so, is incredibly important to remove the pathogens from contact to ensure that our staff are not uh, contagious and, and passing on illnesses to others. Clean washrooms. The washroom creates the perception of how clean a building is. If your washroom is not clean, there will be a perception that the rest of the environment is not clean and it will cause people to be concerned that maybe they're not working in the most hygienic of environments. So it's really important that clean washrooms and a protocol to clean the washroom is in place. How do we protect high risk employees? We know that there are vulnerable people in the community based on age, maybe um, they are immunocompromised. Really important to uh, consider allowing them work from home if they feel uncomfortable being around multiple people in an indoor environment. Of course, it's obvious guys encouraging all people to stay home if they feel unwell um, and reporting that to their employer, or of course, if they've been exposed to someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. Um, isolated workstations are always a good idea for those that feel a little bit more vulnerable if your space permits. Um, making sure that there is access to PPE. Um, masks um, are really important, particularly for those that may have um, an underlying health condition and need further protection. Um, we do recommend um, offering EAP, employee assistance programs, for those that maybe are anxious around returning to work and need further advice um, to remain confident as they come back to the working environment. We do um, advise that if there is a change in uh, workplace health and safety policy as a result of protocol you've introduced, ensuring those policies are clearly visible, ensuring your, poli your policies are accessible to your employees so they can keep abreast of what you are expecting them to do when in the workplace and ensuring that the employees, of course, have received proper training and are constantly informed if there is a new risk or as something evolves uh, in your workplace that, um, you know, the employees need to know about such as staying at home if there's been an outbreak in a certain team, ensuring that you have that communication policy so that at all times your staff are kept up to date. Thank you, Karen. I think this is one of these topics where, well, as you said, I think we're a bit bored about it because we've, we've heard about it so much, but I would say make no mistake because your employees are not going to tell you, hey, it's dirty. I don't like it. They're not going to say it. They're just going to experience it. That will, if it's dirty, it will make them feel that they're not looked after, that the company hasn't really put forward what's needed to make them feel safe, and that's going to have a detrimental impact on their engagement. So I would say this is something that really you want to do more of rather than less of, especially around the training and the communication piece. Um, and that's a good segue into the next topic, which is why, why do you think actually people want to come back? Now, this is the data from our previous event, again, from the mostly senior leaders and executives perspective, where collaborate with colleagues, there is a majority of people who think physical space is critical to that, um, equally with socializing. Um, now, there is some data that supports it. A Stanford study released uh, recently mentioned there's an increase in 15% in new ideas through in-person meetings. Um, if I talk to myself, I come to the office every day. It's just my own thing. Home for me is home and work is work. And the, the environment puts me in the framework of actually being productive and, and working. But as we move through to that next iteration of the office, we had in the past the move from cubicles to open plan. Now the next phase, I think, is going to be even more disruptive and revolutionizing. Nina, that's a good segue to yours. We know as leaders what we want and we think we know what our employees want, but we've been at the forefront of this change, both in, in Canberra and locally. Um, what do you see? Is there a divide between what leaders think and employees and what have you seen in terms of the companies you work with, the project you deliver as um, improvements in delivering a really human-centric uh, approach? Um, mm. To you, thank you, Nina. Yeah, fantastic. So yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for the, the mention of Transform Teams. So, this uh, transform teams business I started nine years ago, 
Uh, after working on the telework program that you mentioned, uh, strategy and implementation uh, approach for the Australian government that was doubling the number of people working from home. So since 2011, actually, I've been uh, working with employers like um, uh, Commonwealth Bank, Westpac, um, uh, Zero, and others who've been uh, leading the way, uh, Microsoft um, leading the way forward. So uh, that the knowledge of how to do how to do flexible workplaces at that time was very much. Um, get the manager and the employee to work it out. Between them, they need to solve the problem. It's really just a, you know, a kind of communication issue. It's just, a, this is just a management problem. Whereas what I noticed was that these, um, the successful flexible workplace employers were actually building a system. They were looking at this as a, as a much more integrated approach across their whole organization. And seeing that actually flexibility creates challenges in how we measure work in the technology that we use, um, it creates legal issues and um, health and safety problems. Um, it can create uh, a whole lot of um, management capability questions where managers have to actually work out how do we how do we manage people remotely. Um, and so that that's a problem I I wanted to um, to solve for businesses to be able to show them how to how to play like the big guys really and actually get um, get to the point where they could be successful flexible workplaces themselves and realize that win win and so that's that's what we do um, we help we you know we help hybrid workplaces now we used to call it flexible um, and now we call it hybrid and um, and there's you know degree of flexibility in there as well um, to establish a workplace that's attractive and productive so one where people want to be there and they're, they're doing their great work so thank you for that and to your question um, about what's the you know you, you asked about the difference between uh, whether there is a difference between leaders and employees in the way they see, this, see things so this is something I've actually really been trying to understand the whole time I've been doing this work and we're now getting really clear research around it which is fantastic um, what I couldn't quite I couldn't quite understand was how leaders could see things so differently to how their employees see it. And um, the more I worked with organizations, the more we did, we've done things like the Leesman survey, for example, which is a, an extensive um, discussion at all levels of the organization, a survey around what are their preferences for the workspace and for the way that they work in the space. And often leaders have actually got a very different view um, to how they use the space to their employees. So leaders uh, are working generally in a more collaborative way and in a more integrated way with a variety of different people. Um, also, they tend to be more mobile. And if they've got an EA, they tend to have a balance to that mobility with a stable space, a stable person in the office who can... Um, who can all, who their people can always come to so they don't always get the downsides of mobility that their people are experiencing um, and remoteness they actually have a different experience in the workplace to what their people do and to me that's the best explanation for why um, leaders and employees see things quite differently is they actually have quite different work styles so it just inherently doesn't really gel for leaders they don't really feel it they don't have the same um experience and now we're getting research around that so uh, last year there was some research came out from uh, let me just tell you exactly <laughs> who, who it's from uh, I think it's from research sorry from workforce software and so they were showing that 82 percent at that time they looked into flexibility preferences and 82 percent of employers felt that they offered flexibility of hours uh, whereas only 59 percent of their employees felt that they did. And so McKinsey's written on this quite a lot. It's called the workforce experience gap. And it's essentially saying that right now we've got this very widespread reality that leaders and employees see the workplace quite differently and understand what the experience of each of, of the uh, in the workplace should be. So I think that's critical for us to, to be aware of that those stats around what do leaders think um, are not necessarily the, the way that employees will see things. And certainly, you know, when you mentioned things like hygiene, um, where they should be, you know, let's, let's talk a bit more about all of that too, because in my experience, they, they do have different views on those. Oh, and Rent2Kill's research mentioned 84% uh, 
that targeted employees, our research, which was more of a senior leader and exec, was 70%. So already there, there's this slight gap. Our employees are actually more concerned mm. than, than what we think. Mm, yes. And so on hygiene, I think um, what I've noticed is that different employees in different workplaces see that issue differently. Um, and whether it's the most important reason for them or not is, is certainly up for question. In one of my clients recently, it was way down the list at about number eight on their decision making kind of framework. Um, but that's going to be different in different workplaces and certainly how much client contact they have and how much how many different people are coming in how mobile the workforce is so it's sort of bringing in different germs all that might might change the way people see a hygiene issue um and nina it's interesting as well i mean we had one client recently who you know were trying to do the right thing they they introduced hot desks they moved to a smaller space uh to give people the flexibility to work from home um they had a roster basis but what they failed to consider was that the employees were horrified at the idea of using a hot desk because, again, the employees have a heightened sense of hygiene and didn't want to share that space. So if you're introducing that you know, methodology, then consider the hygiene protocol around those hot desks. What do those hot desks need to be treated with regularly to say, yes, we're recognizing a hybrid working model and we're facilitating that with a smaller space? But we're also keeping it clean and hygienic so that you feel comfortable whilst you're here. So lots Definitely. to consider. Definitely. Yeah. And that, that's always been such an important part, say, of you know, establishing an activity-based workplace where you're um, you have a variety of different work settings and all of those work settings are shared and people are fully mobile within the space. Um, one of the first questions people have when when you're doing a workplace change like that is how are we going to keep the desks clean? Um, is there going to be sanitizer at the end of each of the, the blocks? And uh, will, will people be required to wipe down their workstations? So it's genuinely a concern that people have, not just because of pandemic. So this is a chance to get that sorted. Um, so thank you for this, um, for throwing up this slide here, Pierre. And um, I guess the, the points we're talking about here around the, the variable nature of preferences that people have, um, that, that shows um, that we're essentially, we're dealing with a design challenge here. So um, I see the situation as a, essentially a disruption where we've, what's happened is we've created, there's a new level of complexity, a really a much higher degree of complexity in the workplace. We used to, it was used to, used to be, say, the difference between a, a cube and a, um, a cube and a, um, I was just, someone's dropped a little note there, they can see the slides changing. So um, I'm not sure whether, whether, whether we're looking at the modern hybrid workplace slide. Um, uh, no, all good. Thanks, all right. Michelle. Um, Michelle, that is probably your internet connection, I would suggest. Um, I, have uh, in my ear people telling me they they can't see the slide changing. Ah, sure, yes. Um, well, let, I'll describe I'll describe the the concept um, in any in any case, and I imagine that we we might be sharing the slides. Uh, so yeah, so we're we're in this we're in this new time where we used to have a very fixed stable model of what did the workplace look like, and you could liken that to a cube you know where it's going to be. If you put that cube down, you know where you're going to find it because there's no way it's rolling around the room or, or moving. We were, we were fixed, in, basically fixed in terms of place and time. Um, and that meant a lot of stability and routine around how people did their work. Now it's like the workplace is more like a sphere. So um, if you put that sphere down, if you put a ball, a beach ball on the ground, there's any chance that it could roll this way or that way. And the only way to actually make it stay exactly where you want it to be is to put some supports around it. Um, and so that has just um, changed the way that we need to, to manage the workplace um, where, where there's a whole lot more complexity. Um, and we, the first basic way to see it is that it's now about workspace and ways of working. So if you have someone working from home two days per week, it's critical that the communication supports that. The leadership style um, that they experience will change the quality of their work 
Um, and also, are they able to work in their individual rhythms? Um, and now that people are working from home, say two, three, or even four days per week, um, if that's the norm in, in your workplace, then what, does the, what is the role of the space and how are you going to attract people back to that space? And should those spaces be like they were before or should they now serve a different purpose um, and one that's really uniquely suited to the office? Um, and so those questions together uh, really show us that, you know, we actually can't, we can't separate them out. The workplace is now both the space and the ways of working. This is the most fundamental way to think about it. When we're creating an integrated workplace experience, it's no longer just about the building. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw, heard an interesting analogy recently about restaurants and of course COVID happened, no one was going to restaurant, but doesn't mean that we think restaurants are over. They just right. probably we're going to go to the ones that provide us a great experience. That's very different than home. But those that don't provide that or that don't have uh, an advantage versus home, we're just not going to go to. Mm, exactly. And I think about it like, you know, I think it's like people have now they've they've discovered that previously it's so a pre covid it's like they were working with one of those, um, it's called a Nokia 811, you know, the, that banana phone that featured in the Matrix from like 1996. Um, you know, they, they, they realized, oh, they were, they were working with that. Now they've had a taste of what it's like to use an iPhone 11. Um, it's more powerful, it's more personalized, and it's more productive. And so why would they want to swap back to the banana phone? when they can use an iPhone 11. And I don't say iPhone 13 because I think there's still some tweaking for organizations to come up to being, um, you know, fully with the times and having something that's the best that it can be. Um, but, but why would you not have something that's really personalized, productive and powerful that you can use? And it doesn't make sense to employees why their, why their boss, their employer, you know, why their decision makers would be asking them to go back to a banana phone. That doesn't make sense. They know that they're there to, good, to do a good job and most people come to work to do a good job. We know that that's, that's substantiated in leadership theories and in research, that a good 90% of people, all else being equal, you know, there's been no um, major trauma in their relationship with their employer. They will come to work to do a good job and they're really looking for an employer that's going to equip them to do that. Oh, absolutely. And I think we've seen a massive growth in the, the importance of purpose as a driver. And when you think about workplace, that really impacts your purpose because if you ask people to come in and there's no reason for them to come in or there's no value add for them to come in, that's wasted time. So that's purposeless action. And that's really something to think about when you're thinking about return to the office. I'm conscious of time, Nina, you have a, a few more information to share. Great. Yeah. So then, um, so, so in a very, you know, kind of brief view that this is just one aspect of the picture there. So you, what are, in creating that integrated workplace experience for staff that's attractive, where they can be productive in the, in the space. The one, as, one aspect of that only is how do they behave in the space and what are, what, um, how do they behave when they're at home? And this just shows that there's a whole range of different drivers of behavior that will impact their style. So to the question around, should there be one rule that we put in place um, that will solve the problem, essentially, because I think that's, you know, we'd, we'd really like there to be one simple solution to this disruption. Um, when you look at this, you can see how there's just a, a significant degree of variety and diversity essentially in how people will operate it's whether they whether they want flexibility themselves how initially engaged they were with the with the uh, business um, whether they are working in a mobile way and do they need clients uh, do they need to be doing you know work with clients off-site do they have a teamwork style that facilitates remote communication and collaboration and does that well and uses the tools well? Um, do they have a need for the services and the amenities in the office? Do they need to come in for printing for, you know, for using a room that they can't use elsewhere for great collaborative um, 
meetings and connections with colleagues and what's their own digital capability like and that of their colleagues and where do they want to be <laughs> so you know do they have a home office for example do they have children under feet at home that mean that they they want to actually be in the space so there's a whole range of different ways for us to understand this um, and it's certainly um, you know without doing the investigations like like you and I have talked about here the need that you know that employers are now listening more closely to what their employees are, are wanting so without doing that piece to understand workplace behavior profiles um, there isn't much chance of getting the design right mm -hmm. to make the workplace uh, an attractive and productive prop, uh, proposition and, and offer to, to, to people. Oh, totally and I think going back to the point of five generations it's, it's now to, to your point here about place it's really really key to one have a different approach to each individual because each individual has a different work style they have different home situation they live in different places so it's the easier thing is to rule out um, place a rule that uh, is the same for everyone but putting the investment into understanding how each employee wants to work in especially in the context of uh, shortage of labor cost of real estate the inefficiencies of real estate now if you have the data you cater it then for your next iteration of design you can really improve bottom lines and engagement totally yeah absolutely and it's quite exciting you know where where things can head so um so there's you know there even though we're writing the playbook the, the playbook hasn't been written this isn't mm -hmm. and i think the best way to arrive at a solution for each organization is to design for for themselves you know you wouldn't walk into someone else's house and put their clothes on um, and you need your own wardrobe that works for you and for your own circumstances, for your own needs. So, so just um, taking a kind of blanket rule, a blanket approach to designing your workplace model um, is, is just kind of foolish for productivity. Um, so so but there are some, you know, there are some guiding rules and some principles that are starting to emerge. So Linda Grattan has uh, released a book only last week um, called Redesigning Work. She's been a long-standing professor of management uh, focused on this flexible work uh, question. And so she she has she actually released these principles last year in an article in um, MIT Sloan Review. Um, but this is um, one of the ways we could look at how do we manage the place and time now that those two things are no longer fixed in that cube. We can design the office for cooperation. Um, I would add in there that there's a need to add privacy and focus elements to the office. We're really missing that. Um, and that's what people need. That's often why they're at home. So if you want to attract them back to the space, you've got to be able to provide them with really awesome focus space. Um, then making work from home a source of energy. And energy can mean different things, but when you dig into what she means by that, she's really saying that people can be um, rejuvenated by spending their time at home. You can also do that in the office, for example, with biophilic design um, and you know, creating spaces that are actually refreshing, thinking about the quality of the air, to Karen's point, um, where people could actually come into the office and be rejuvenated rather than being... Um, but, you know, so working from home could be one of the sources of energy. There might be also the office. Um, the time principle, letting that asynchronous time boost people's focus. Um, and so that is where you're not being constantly distracted by um, notifications, but having time to, to think that totally makes sense. And then enabling synchronized time to be the basis of coordination. So we could add in there cooperation, collaboration and communication. Um, that, that time together enables people to, um, yeah, to be more synchronized and, and we're actually being careful and planning, planful, <laughs> I'm going to make up a word, um, about how to, you know, how to manage that synchronized time. Mm. And it's very interesting you, ma you mentioned um, having time to isolate, separate. We've been tracking the data. The, we have a heat mapping system that looks at each individual work point occupancy, That's not only at one point in time, but all the time. And the actual desking, the workstation is the least occupied. Why? Because probably open space came out. It's a good way of making efficiencies and saving costs, but it's actually the least utilized. That lead us, um, it's a good segue to just a brief snapshot of what some other companies are doing. Um, on the left side, we have Airbnb, uh, Google in the middle, and Salesforce. Obviously, they're all 
best uh, places to work for, they're all embracing flexibility and empowerment. And I think that's a key to really understanding why employees want to come to the office, what's their personal preference, and let them decide how they want to work. Provided you have all the metrics to measure productivity and that everyone's doing a good job, as you pointed out, Nina, most people want to do a good job. So it's about allowing them to do that on their own time and when it's best for them. About focus, yeah, we, we can't be focused nine to five. Sometimes nine to 12, we just don't want to work. But five to 10, we're super productive. So allowing them that and giving them the infrastructure to do that. Yeah, um, I think, sorry, just worth calling out as well that, you know, for those businesses that are very rigid, and dogmatic about a full return to work. What we are seeing from some of the research, and it's not our own research, is the rise in presentism. Mm -hmm. And this is where employees are being forced to return to the office. We need to remember we're still in a pandemic and the prevalence of sickness is higher than it's ever been. So, you know, for those that are being forced to return to the working environment, potentially they are contagious and the long-term ramifications that that can have to the business you know, it can, it can result in a shutdown. So there has to be that recognition that, you know, just how strong your policy around returning to work is and what impact that has psychologically on the employee who feels that they must always be in the office. So, you know, the, the presentism is, is almost as bad as absenteeism right now and, and worth calling out. Oh, totally. That's what happens when you measure on, on hours spent rather than, than actual output, which is interesting segue into... Um, the last piece of data, which we gathered from our, our, our last survey, um, yes, we can see improving assets. And in that sense, we're talking about least office utilization is the number one uh, concern. Why? Because that's the way commercial space is done. You take a long lease and it's not designed properly. From our own data, of our own office, we've seen individual workstations are used less than 12.5% of the time. And out of uh, all the meetings, Meeting rooms that are booked, only one third of meeting rooms are actually properly utilized. That is, have an occupancy or bumps on seat of 80% or more. So when we go to that point around allocating funds to support the change, having the right data, accurately budget, well, if you think about the fact that companies have been carrying surplus real estate forever, simply because it hasn't been designed properly. So if you think that you're desking in a layout which represents 70% of the area, that's utilized 12.5%. Again, that varies from industries to industries. But if you design with data for the next iteration, then you can really plan for the long term and save on underutilized space, which helps save long term real estate costs and so on. There's also a point now a lot of companies are downsizing that puts pressure on the uh, supply side, which means you have opportunities to actually leverage your new lease negotiation for incentives to design in the long run what you're looking for. Um, that's it for, for us. I have a couple of questions for our speakers, but firstly, I had a question uh, which has been answered from, from Chloe, but yes, the, the data, Chloe, from rental kill side comes from employees in New Zealand, from our side comes from senior leaders um, and execs uh, of New Zealand companies, mostly uh, medium to large size companies. Um, but very happy to share more details. Uh, feel free to give me a call. If anyone has any questions, please post them in the chat. In, in the absence of any at this time, I will ask my very own question, which I'm quite passionate about. It's a question to Nina. Uh, we've seen in the studies in the US showing that remote work is encouraging job hopping because people are more available to conduct interviews rather than when they're doing presentism in the office. Um, What's your what's your thought on that, and how do you think employees can mitigate employers can mitigate it? That it is a great question, and so I do believe that people are shaped by the environment that they are in to a large degree. That their behaviours are, um, are can be tracked. So if you if you look at there there is um, a great Kiwi leadership and consultant leadership consultant who I um, heard speak last week who talked about how. He works on the basis that 70% of people's um, behavior is, is attributed to the environment that they're, that they're in. Mm -hmm. So we can look at people, why are people behaving this way? And what are the environmental forces that are, that are shaping that? And, and I actually think that um, 
for a lot of people, they have started to see their employer and their role in a different light. And so, yes, they may have the time to now go and do interviews um, and not be as visible that they're leaving the office in a suit. Where are you going? Um, I think actually that they have, they're rethinking and the, it's the relationship, um, that contract of expectations that they have of their employer has often not been met because many employers um, did the best that they could, but struggled to support their people. The managers weren't able or capable to the same degree that they needed to be of um, managing remote and flexible teams. And so people have actually had, um, you know, and I use the word lightly, they've had a degree of not trauma, but, you know, serious difficulty. Um, and they haven't seen their employers doing enough to solve that. And so they're thinking, well, I'm not, I'm not really, a, I'm not really going to stick around for this. Um, I'm not, this isn't something I want to be, um, I want to continue to do. And they're, if they're not seeing enough being done to solve that, and their own workplace experience is, is a negative one. Um, then yeah, then that's, that's why I think they're moving. Um, that's a big part of it. It's complex, you know, human motivation is complex. We won't be able to find one single answer for that. Mm. Um, yeah, but there's, there's great research around, there's great, um, really powerful model, which I love. I love the rule of threes when there's something that distills down to three, um, uh, we can, we can easily, you know, keep it with us mm -hmm. so if we think so this model is from Sorota and Klein they published it in 2014 I found it incredibly powerful for understanding remote and flexible teams um, and what they discovered is that regardless of age or industry or job role there are three driving motivators for people at work the first is achievement like we've been saying people want to come they come to work to do a good job is that satisfaction of doing good work the second is fairness and equity. So if people feel that they've been unfairly treated, that drives at the heart of their understanding of whether this is a decent employer or not, their engagement is going to drop if they feel that just the way that things have happened and unfolded has been unfair. And the third is a surprising one, and it's camaraderie. And so that's what's been affected in the last two years is people's ability to commit, to connect, um, to have warm working relationships um, with people. And so it's actually surprisingly important. And this is something employees kind of need to tap into more, um, to create those opportunities to connection and, um, to, to, um, endorse that, to support it, to, um, yeah, to say that that's valid. Oh, thank you. And a um, very good segue into uh, our poll. I have four questions to the audience, which I will launch now, but on the topic of purpose, um, we have a few questions on sustainability, which will inform our, our next event. So I'll just launch the point and read out um, a, a question from uh, Gareth. Um, Gareth um, has heard reports showing some organization that went full, full uh, remote work have seen drops in productivity. And can you advise if this is correct or um, and whether there is research on why productivity dropped from home? Hmm. Yeah, I um I can't comment exactly on whether it whether it's correct for every organization that would have gone fully remote that they would have experienced that drop in productivity. And there's a few problems of being able to do that. But in my experience, I can definitely say that um that working 100 percent remotely for say, let's say more than a week or two, um, is such a um, an extreme capability challenge for organizations that most organizations probably won't get that right. So in the time pre-COVID, I think I met about three people in that whole time who were working remotely and making it work. And in each case, their organization, uh, one of them was actually a guy in Ireland, Karen, who was working for MYOB. And so he had worked for MYOB for 18 months. It was working well, but MYOB had done a huge amount of work to establish the patterns. The, um, they worked out their communication. They knew which work was swapping where. They found ways to connect him in. So he was getting that camaraderie. And, and his skill was valuable enough to them that they were going to do that work to make that happen. So what's actually, what's happened, I think, is that people have, um, you know, been flummoxed by the pandemic. It's, it's thrown everything up in the air. 
Um, people have struggled to find organizations, employers have struggled to find really good ways to make this work. And um, the capability just hasn't been built yet. And so it's a little mm -hmm. bit of kind of trying to build the raft while you're riding it, but the raft is back there because some places are, are sinking. So I definitely do think that there's um, a strong possibility that 100% that remote would be um, really unproductive for, yeah, for most organisations. That's, and I think that's, that's very fair. I've spoken to a few leaders and employees also in the knowledge industry specifically, a big challenge around learning and how actually the younger generation gets the experience, the ad hoc interactions that help them grow their career. Uh, we have a, a question from Greg Moore, Karen. I think it's a topic for everyone. Um, what can you advise as solutions for air quality control? And I think they're important for probably property owners as well, because this is something that new tenants are going to request a lot more of in the future. Thanks, Pierre. Um, look, you know, air purification solutions have been around for many, many years. They are not new, um, but what, they, what the pandemic has done is obviously escalated the need for uh, mechanical support indoors when natural ventilation is not possible. The one thing that we do say to clients is that if you are purchasing an air purification solution in the pandemic to deal with minimizing viral transmission, then at least choose a solution that can make a viral efficacy claim. So you will see many, many solutions um, on the shelf um, that make certain claims around dust and pollens and danders, allergens, etc. But don't actually claim to scrub the air of viral load. And that's really, really important. So the one thing that we um, suggest is at a minimum, the air purification solution you choose should have a medical grade HEPA 13 filter. That's really important. Anything less than H13 will not trap viral pathogens from the air. Um, and look, from a hygiene, initial hygiene perspective, we would tend to go out on site and conduct uh, an on-premise audit to ascertain what solutions are required where, because uh, positioning of the devices is equally as important as choosing the right device. Mm -hmm. So many factors to consider, and that's why um, you know purchasing a, a system off the shelf is probably not recommended if you're trying to keep the air free from sickness. And um, we would recommend a consultation on site to assess the, the individual environment. Awesome, thank you, Karen. And we know who to contact. Uh, for that obviously we have a, an anonymous attendee asking a question how do you manage um, a workplace where the two-third uh, can do hybrid and the other third uh, are not able to do that and have to be physically on site so i guess from a communication standpoint and a people management standpoint how would you approach this i i think i'll probably ask you karen because that's that's relevant to rent a kill you have people that are front staff they, they need to be on site and then the more knowledge or admin workers who have the choice. So how has that played out in Rental Kill, who employs 8,500 people? Is that correct? That's right, yeah. That's Look, a lot of people. We are, we are a, a frontline service delivery company. So we do recognize, like many businesses, that there are roles within our business where it's not possible to work from home. You know, we are out servicing customers on the front line. We worked through COVID. We were considered an essential service. And absolutely, that posed challenges for us as an employer. What we did do with those frontline staff was reassure them, offer them all of the necessary protection. We introduced COVID safe protocol. You know, some of them I mentioned in my presentation, if you are sick, stay home, do not come to work. If you've been a close contact, make contact with your health and safety contact um, at rent kill very quickly. Give them the reassurance through offering, you know, PPE, um, access to rat, rapid antigen tests. Um, on a frequent basis. Um, just putting in all of the protocols that we can to ensure those, reassure those people that we're, we're doing all we can to keep them safe. It is unfortunate there were people in our business and, and still are that have the flexibility of a hybrid approach and we support that, but we are a frontline service organization that do require our people to work in the field. We just need to make sure we keep them safe and protected. Mm. And again, most important that they have access to our health and safety policies and are fully informed on what they need to do to keep themselves and our customers safe at all times. Well, thank you very much, Karen. I think um, I'm going to stop here. Unfortunately, there's a lot more questions that I have at least, which I'd like to share, but I'll probably we'll catch up next week. For um, our audience, uh, thank you very much um, for all of you who joined. I really appreciate uh, 
I'm also glad to announce the next one will be in person. Um, personally, I'm missing that. Um, it's a lot harder to um, speak with people and keep them engaged when you're behind the screen and the only person you can see is your, your face. Um, that's interesting. It changed the perspective of a lot of people. I think Zoom because they've been able to see themselves a lot more. So from a self-esteem standpoint, that's been quite tricky. But <laughs> enough of that. Thank you very much, everyone. I will just uh, launch a little poll to ask what you thought about this event. Please um, don't hesitate to be honest. It's really important for us. We want to be continuing to do that. We we'll launch a series of events next on sustainability, budgeting, and planning, um, and how to help generally Kiwi businesses. Uh, through that phase. I think personally, there's an amazing opportunity. We know utilization of offices have been low forever and we know they cost money. So if you think about uh, growing inflation, um, growing needs to engage staff, there's really an opportunity to rethink, rationalize, do more with less. We we'll also have sustainable uh, legislation that will come through that will impact the bottom line. So this is a fantastic opportunity and can't wait to be talking more about it with you so thanks very much to everyone have a lovely afternoon uh, morning actually and we'll see you next time thank you pierre thank you bye-bye thank you very much bye bye